All right, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about cleat covers. And here's an example of a construction that we'll be seeing later in the talk. Uh, first, just a bit about uh, Hamilton College, where I'm from, uh, and the collaborators that I've had on this research. Uh, Hamilton College is a small liberal arts college in Clinton, New York. Uh, in pink, uh, it's very picturesque. Uh, it's a very small college with less than 2,000 undergraduate students. There's no graduate students at the college. Uh, here's New York in the United States. And when people think of New York, they usually think of this little thing here at the bottom, which is New York City. Uh, but New York is actually quite big. And where I am in New York, Clinton, right here in the center, which is four and a half hours driving from New York. So whenever, but whenever anyone asks where I'm from, I have to say New York State. New York State, not New York, the city. Um, the work that you'll be hearing about today is uh, not yet published. So you're getting cutting edge new results. And all of the work was done with undergraduate students. So no graduate students at all. And here are the six students that I've worked with. Uh, several of them have graduated already uh, just because they've done such hard work for me. I want to call out their names, Anthony Hevia, Ben Callis, Summer McClintock, Sam Reisner, Louise Thompson, and John Wilson. All right, so we'll be talking about edge cleat covers today. And so we should first introduce the problem. For, uh, you're given as input an undirected and unweighted graph, G with vertex set V and edge set E. And you're asked to find a minimum cardinality set of cliques that cover all the edges of the graph. So what do I mean by cover all of the edges? Each edge is in at least one clique. It could be in more than one clique. And again, here, a clique, just to remind us of the definition, uh, it's a set of vertices that are all adjacent to each other. So for example, here, these five vertices, we have edges between all pairs. And so this is a clique. And here, the minimum number of cliques required to cover all of the edges in this graph is four. A tool that we'll be using uh, in our research is in fact, the vertex cleat cover problem, uh, which is slightly different than edge cleat covers. Uh, again, you're given a graph and you're asked to cover it with cliques, but you only need to cover the vertices now. You don't have to color, uh, cover all of the edges. So you can see there's two edges here that are not covered. Uh, and as you can see in this instance, we only needed two cliques to cover the graph. And in fact, that's the minimum number of cliques for this graph, okay. The goal of my research here is to compute exact minimum edge cleat covers on real world graphs that have millions of vertices. Of course, there's going to be some challenges that come along with that. And so if you'll allow me, I'm gonna be telling you a story today that kind of goes through the challenges uh, and talks about how to eventually do this to compute exact minimum edge cleat covers on real world graphs. All right, so a bit of an introduction to some techniques that we'll be using. The first is data reduction. Uh, so data reduction takes a decision problem. In our case, the decision problem is, does the graph have an edge cleat cover of size at most K, All right? Because we're trying to minimize, so it's at most K. And we're given this pair G, K to indicate that. Uh, a data reduction transforms a given instance of a decision problem to another instance of the same decision problem by changing the graph and possibly changing the number K. And we say it's a data reduction if the uh, original instance is a answer is yes, if and only if in the new instance, the answer is also yes, meaning there is an edge cleat cover of a certain size. All right. Uh, a very simple example of a data reduction rule for edge cleat cover is a degree one vertex. So here I have this vertex. It only has one neighbor in the graph. That means this edge is in only one clique, right? So you can instantly add that to your uh, edge cleat cover and then remove it because that edge is covered. No other clique will ever contain it. You remove it from the graph, you're left with this. And then you ask, can I cover the rest with K minus one cliques? Um, this is actually quite powerful. In particular, if you applied this to a tree exhaustively, you can cover all the edges leading to leaves. You remove all of them. You cover the next level, cover the next level. So this will allow you, this simple reduction will allow, allows you to solve trees uh, in polynomial time. All right, so there's some interesting theoretical questions that come along with data reductions. The first is, is it possible to reduce by applying these data reductions over and over to a certain 
uh, function of k, which is our parameter. So I give you k, which is the number of cliques required to cover it. Could you reduce it to something very small, some function of k? Right. So this is a theoretical question. Um, this is an interesting question, and it's actually been answered pretty authoritatively for the edge clique cover problem, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but I'm more interested in this practical question. Can we reduce the graph enough to actually solve it in practice? Right? You make it small enough, solve it in practice. Um, okay, so why is that an interesting question? Uh, it's an interesting question because edge clique covers NP hard, right? And it's also hard to approximate within a polynomial factor. That, ouch, that hurts. Okay. Uh, same with vertex clique covers, hard to approximate, NP hard. Um, for edge clique cover, there's four data reduction rules. They work pretty well in practice. For a vertex clique cover, there's six data reduction rules. So it works well in practice. And I'm going to use the following to say four is bad, six is good. It turns out having an extra two reductions can reduce the graph a lot further. So the tools we have for vertex clique cover are more powerful than the tools we have for edge clique cover. Furthermore, these six are actually very different from these four. Um, so potentially there's additional power in those six reductions. Okay, again, just comparing kind of what's known between edge clique cover and vertex clique cover problems. The total time to apply these reductions is here M squared, M here being the number of edges squared. So if you have millions of edges, ouch. Uh, whereas here for vertex clique cover, we have more efficient reductions. This is the square of the max degree, which is usually small in sparse graphs, times the number of vertices. That's much faster. Okay, so again, there's kind of a problem here with data reduction in edge clique cover, but something nice in vertex clique cover. Okay. Um, there's a guaranteed kernel in the edge clique cover of size two to the K, where K is the number of cliques. Again, that's a bit of an ouch. Uh, if K is large, more than log N, this is just the number of vertices in the graph, so you haven't reduced at all. Um, but for vertex clique cover, the situation is even worse. There's no kernel guarantee. And in fact, um, it's if there were a kernel, uh, you would solve P equal to NP. <laughs> Lovely. All right. Um, kernel can be large in practice, but over here, vertex clique cover, small in practice. Okay, so another benefit to vertex clique cover. Okay. Um, and what can you currently solve with each of the techniques? From edge clique cover, you can solve graphs of up to 10K. For vertex clique cover, up to 2.5 million. Okay, so what I want to get at here is the tools we have for edge clique cover right now really aren't as powerful as the tools that we have for vertex clique cover. Okay. Um, all right. Finally, it's unlikely any non exponential kernel exists here in theory. All right. There's a hardness result that shows the polynomial time, the hierarchy collapses if such a thing existed to, to the third level. Um, here, that's unlikely any kernel exists, and this is due to graph coloring, right? Graph coloring for k equal three is hard. It's complementary to this problem. So if you find any kernel, you've solved p equal np. All right. Finally, um, people have been working on the edge clique cover problem, but all the new work tends to be heuristic, trying to find good solutions, but that aren't necessarily optimal. Um, and right now, we don't have any way to evaluate how effective they are in practice because we don't know exact solutions. All right. So <clears throat> uh, the question is, can, can't we use vertex clique cover reductions? And the answer is absolutely you can. But as far as I know, no one has tried this. Uh, and what you can do is transform an edge clique cover instance into a vertex clique cover instance using this polynomial time transformation by Co et al. Uh, this is the transformation they use to show that edge clique covers NP hard, right? Um, or actually vertex clique covers NP hard. Okay. Uh, so here I'm gonna highlight the cliques in this graph just so we can kind of see them, how this transformation uh, goes forward. Uh, what we're going to do is create this uh, set of vertices, one for each edge. Okay, again, because we're going from edge land to vertex land. Um, and so now we have the number of vertices equal to the number of edges. And then what we'll do is we'll connect vertices 
together if they're in a clique in the original graph, right? Sorry, if their edges are in a clique in the original graph. So here, these three edges form a triangle. And so in our new graph, they're going to form a triangle these, between these vertices. So the idea being that uh, here, a vertex clique cover of this triangle ends up being an edge clique cover of this triangle. Okay, and you do this for every set of vertices that are inside of a clique. And this sounds really bad and really expensive to compute, uh, but it turns out that there's a very simple way to describe this rather than in a clique, in a triangle or a four clique, because those are subsets of all the cliques that are triangles or bigger. And so all you need to do then is enumerate all the triangles and the four cliques and create all of these edges. Oof, there we go, beautiful. All right, uh, now you can see it looks more complex, right? There's more vertices, potentially a lot more edges. And so it's blowing up the size of the graph potentially by quite a bit, okay? So it doesn't seem like this tool would necessarily be effective out of the box just from the picture as I have here, All right? Um, oh, one thing to note, we have a clique in the original graph if and only if the clique in the new graph. So we can use the new graph, use whatever vertex clique cover algorithm you want, solve it, and now you're gonna have an edge clique cover in your All right, so uh, M edges in G become M vertices in the new graph. If M is big, ouch. Um, the M edges in G becomes M choose two potentially edges in the new graph really ouch, okay? So if you're looking at a million edges, you're talking about a million squared and ouch, okay? Very, very ouch, talking in the trillions then potentially. Uh, okay, so um, the data reductions that exist for edge clique cover, uh, which were done by Graham et al, actually execute in M squared worst case time. So by doing this transformation, you're not technically taking any more uh, theoretical time, um, but because we have additional tools from vertex clique cover, it could be very beneficial to do this transformation. Um, but, um, ouch. So what I wanna show is if you start out with a sparse graph, because we're interested in covering sparse graphs, when you do the transformation, you end up with a sparse graph. Of course, it's gonna become a little denser potentially, but you're gonna end up with a sparse graph. Okay, and so we're gonna use this measure called degeneracy. And degeneracy is the following. Look at all the possible subgraphs and ask what's the minimum degree of that subgraph. All right, so here I have this clique, the minimum degree in the clique is three. All right, let's look at maybe another subgraph here. I have this triangle, minimum degree is two. Look at all of the subgraphs, look at their minimum degrees and take the maximum over them. Okay, and in that case, you get a vertex in this clique and it has smallest degree four, that's the degeneracy of the graph. Uh, in real world graphs, uh, the sparse graphs, D is generally pretty small. Okay, so this is a, a good measure. Um, there's a simple way to compute this. It goes as, follow, as follows, remove a vertex of minimum degree and you put it in an order, and first in an ordering, and then remove the next vertex of minimum degree and it goes next in the order and you keep doing this procedure, which you can do in linear time and the degeneracy is the vertex, uh, the degree of the vertex with the most later neighbors in this ordering, um, which again, in general, small in sparse graphs. Okay, so an observation I wanna make, uh, this is uh, known already, the graph has degeneracy D, then it has at most D and edges, okay? Uh, and the argument for that is pretty simple. You look, oh, I have at most D later neighbors. All of my vertices have at most D later neighbors. And so I count up all the edges from the earlier neighbor to the later neighbor, and I have at most D. -N. All right, uh, so here's our theorem. Uh, if your graph has degeneracy D, when you do the conversion, you get at most this many edges, D squared M. Okay, so if D is held constant, the number of edges actually asymptotically stays the same. Um, if D is, I don't know, log, then that's also a lot better. Log squared M is way better than M squared for certain. Uh, and so the transformation then might be worth it for sparse graphs. All right, uh, and the proof sketch goes like this. The number of edges is actually big O, the number of triangles and the number of four cliques, because that's all that the edges you create are between triangles and four cliques. Uh, and so you can count each triangle or four clique, 
by looking at an edge that comes less lexicographically first in the ordering. So here, if I look at this triangle and I want to count it as being a part of this edge, then I look at it in the ordering. There's some edge that comes lexicographically first in it, and then it has some later neighbor. And you can ask how many of these later neighbors do you have? And then that will give you the number of triangles in the graph. Okay, so you can have at most D later neighbors in common. So you can have at most D times M triangles because for each uh, edge you have at most D later neighbors, D times M. All right, number of cliques, you can do exactly the same thing. Look at the lexicographically first edge in the ordering. There's D choose two ways of choosing these two later neighbors that form the four clique. And so you end up with D squared M number of edge, uh, four cliques total. And so the size of the graph then is D squared M. Pretty cool. All right, so um, what this says is, so if you, your input graph has degeneracy D, then it also has average degree D, which is nice, uh, big O D. The new graph also now has average degree then uh, D squared. Uh, pretty cool. Okay, uh, moreover, you can construct it in the time that, it took me to enumerate the triangles and the four cliques. And so it can be constructed in this time. And let's go through it. I think somebody needs to mute. All right. Uh, you first compute the degeneracy ordering, linear time. Uh, then you enumerate the triangles, dm time, enumerate the four cliques, d squared m time, done. All right. So uh, meanwhile, in practice, meanwhile, so I want to look at a couple of graphs that you might see in a typical uh, work and number of vertices, number of edges, and what the degeneracy might be. Okay, so here in this graph, the wiki vote graph, uh, we have n as 7,000, m as 100,000, and d is 53. So degeneracy, very, very small compared to number of uh, vertices, number of edges. Uh, and so, like, using degeneracy as a parameter, really seems to make sense. But when we look at the transformed graph, let's look at some of the numbers. Okay, so then this is the number of vertices, it's 100K. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, the number of edges blew up quite significantly in theory still. So like the question is, is it worth it? Uh, yes, question. Well, that's a, the worst case. The worst case, right. So in theory, this is what you could get. What do you get in practice? I, I don't know yet. I should do that experiment, right? All very preliminary. Uh, I think it will be smaller than that, but still like worse. Uh, that just hurts for me to look at even. Like I don't want, I didn't want to put that in the table. That's why it's in red, right? It's, oof, ah. Okay, but let's look at some others, other example graphs. We're getting bigger now. So we have almost a million vertices, 4 million edges. D, again, very small, great parameter, but then 4 million vertices, 7 billion edges. And then here we go, this one, 242. But so, ouch. Okay, so it seems like even with this notion of sparsity in play, at least in theory, I, I don't, it, it hurts. It hurts me. Okay. So uh, the thing we could do then, if we want to avoid such things, would be to first reduce the instance using existing edge clique cover reduction rules, uh, then apply the transformation, and then apply vertex clique cover rules, right? So this would be like a now multi-stage pipeline algorithm um, where we're applying all of the tools at our disposal. And again, the goal here is Let's get the graph as small as possible. So when we do the transformation, it doesn't blow up, right? It doesn't blow up, all right. Um, so we're gonna talk about a couple of the edge clique cover uh, rules because they introduce uh, some, in, some challenges in the transformation. I'm gonna talk about two of the rules, but they do introduce um, four different rules. Um, I'm gonna start with reduction two because without it, you won't understand why reduction one is so important. So I'm gonna start with reduction two. The idea is if I give you an edge and we look at its closed neighbor or closed common neighborhood, you can add it to the edge clique cover and cover its edges. So let me go through um, why this works. And of course, some pictures, okay? Intuition, every edge needs to be covered by a clique in an edge clique cover. So let's look at a case where what if I have this edge and 
there's no larger clique that it's in. It's only in that edge of the clique, right? With the degree one, we saw you could cover it. Same case here, the edge is the only clique covering it. And so you could add it to your clique cover. And now you say that edge is covered. Great, uh, perfect, okay? Um, otherwise, what if it's not a single edge, right? But again, it's closed neighborhood is a clique, or sorry, it's common neighborhood uh, between its vertices is a clique. Uh, thing to notice, any clique that I give you uh, contains that edge, right? Because it has to be covered, that edge has to be covered. Uh, and that clique also has to be inside of that closed neighborhood because all of the vertices are adjacent. And so if you gave me an edge clique cover with this clique in it, I could say, you know, uh, instead of that one, I think I'd rather have that one. Let me just cover some additional vertices. And so I still have an edge clique cover of the same cardinality. Um, and so then it's safe to add this clique to our collection. All right. Um, now, now that we know we're covering edges in the graph, we can actually do something if we cover certain collections of edges. Okay, if I give you a vertex, in this case, vertex V, and all of its uh, incident edges are covered, turns out you can remove it from the graph. Okay, um, and so this is very powerful. If you have lots of uh, common neighborhoods that are cliques, you can go through the graph, iteratively apply all of these reductions, and it can be quite effective. Um, very quickly, I wanna argue why this works. All right, so we have this vertex. Um, Suppose I give you another clique that's gonna contain that vertex, right? Suppose you say, you know what? It wasn't safe to remove V. There's this other clique and it has to contain V. Well, I argue that clique has to cover some other edge. Otherwise it's superfluous. You could just remove it. It's not important for the clique cover. And so what you can do then is, uh, so it must cover this edge, is just shrink that clique a little bit, okay? Now all of these edges are covered, okay? This edge is still covered, and so we still have a cover, right? So if you tell me this clique needs to be in, I say, no, I'm gonna choose this one instead. Uh, and so you can do that with any of the cliques that you say would be additional and contain V, and all of these, sorry, all of these edges would still be covered. And so then it's safe to remove V from the graph. All right. Um, so according to Graham et al, you can apply these reductions to the graph in this lovely time here. And again, for us, that's ouch, right? Uh, a million uh, vertices and a few million edges and it, it hurts, okay? So if the theoretical time actually bears out in practice, it is going to be painful. Um, so what we can show is you can quite uh, quite easily get a new algorithm um, that will give you the max degree in the graph squared times number of edges uh, running time. So we went from n being number of vertices to the max degree squared. And in the sparse graphs we consider, max degree is still pretty small. So this might be better than practice. All right, so how does this work? So uh, this reduction one, how would you go through the graph and remove all of the vertices that have all of its edges covered? Well, you could iterate through the entire graph. We know that this uh, every vertex has at most degree this max degree. What you do is uh, you mark everybody in its neighborhood. You do this for all of the vertices and that takes uh, the number of edges time, right? Because you're looking at each edge from each direction. And then you go through all of the adjacency lists and you remove all of the marked vertices. And now in one pass over the graph, or sorry, two passes over the graph, you've removed all, you've applied all the reduction one rules. Okay, so that's linear time. That's quite nice. Um, reduction two, you, again, over each edge now, we wanna find is its neighborhood a clique? Okay, well, we know that the degree of each of these vertices is at most, Delta, okay? So what you can do is in delta squared time, check if this is a clique, right? Because you have delta, at most delta vertices. Each one is gonna have at most delta neighbors. You iterate through all of their neighborhoods and then in d squared time, you check if it's a clique. If you do this for all the edges, then it takes delta squared time. Okay. Delta can still be a little bigger than we would like in practice. So if you can get 
that Delta to go away, that'd be really nice. I don't know how to get it to go away completely. I would love to make it degeneracy, just make it D squared because degeneracy is known to be very small. I can't quite do that, but we can do this. Make one of the deltas and do a degeneracy. Okay, and how does that argument work? Uh, well, this is going to be a clique and it turns out in bounded degeneracy graphs, the clique size is also bounded. It can't be more than D plus one. Okay, which means that if I compute the common neighborhood and it's bigger than D plus one, I can stop and say, it's not going to be a clique, right? Which means that this running time becomes, well, the size of the clique is really D. For each one, I look at all of its at most delta neighbors. I now get D times delta. I do this over all of the edges. I now have D times delta times N, which is a little nicer. I would love the delta to go away. Uh, and it's kind of a next little mini goal for me. All right. Um, so there's a problem with the transformation that we did earlier. It transforms just an input graph to an output graph. It has no notion of edges are covered. Um, and so because these reductions that we talked about cover some edges, we have to be able to handle that in the transformation if we're going to first apply these edge cleat cover rules and then apply transformation. All right, so we have to modify the transformation a bit. And so let's kind of, I wanna give the intuition behind how you modify it and just like the trial and error, right? When you're doing research, not everything works out. So let's just go through the different cases. All right, so here's a, a very simple instance where some edges are covered, some are not, right? This is not necessarily, this is not the result of applying reductions, but some edges are covered, some are not. Well, we can see to, uh, so here these, um, sorry, uh, these dashed lines, these are covered edges. Here we have uncovered edges. And we can see that to cover the remaining covered edges, we need one clique, right? So whatever transformation we do to a vertex clique cover problem, it better give us one clique, right? It needs to be a quote one, right? So what are the different things you could try? Uh, could we leave the covered edges in? and then just do the transformation and then ask, what's the vertex clique cover? Well, uh, I need two cliques here, so no, right? That's too many, okay? We could also ask, all right, do I exclude them from the construction? Okay, in which case, this is what I get. Again, vertex clique cover is too bad, all right? Uh, so the next thing is, well, what if I just use them to construct the edge set? All right, so here I'm starting with this. And then I just get rid of all of the, um, the vertices that correspond to covered edges, right? And it turns out this works, right? This has one clique. Uh, and so why does it work? It gives you that this clique corresponds to this triangle, right? What we're missing with these other two, um, possible candidate constructions is that this is in a triangle, right? It's in a triangle. And so here, this two clique now represents that triangle when you remove the covered edges um, from this graph. Okay, and so this construction works, right? And again, the intuition is it's like you did the transformation, the original transformation, and then you just remove everything that's covered and then you still get the cliques, all right? And it turns out you can do it implicitly, but it's not so interesting, I think, to talk about. All right. So uh, I want to talk a little bit. So suppose we've done now the transformation. We're now in vertex clique cover land. Like, does applying these new reductions actually benefit us at all? Like, is it more powerful? Is it really more powerful than the original reductions? If we just apply all the gram et al stuff, will we actually... Is the juice worth the squeeze is the, the question, okay? And so I wanna talk about a couple of vertex clique cover reductions and then like put them in the context of, okay, if I did the transformation and I apply the vertex clique cover reduction, what is it actually doing to the edge clique cover problem, okay? So one of the reductions, uh, and these are reductions that I developed with my student, Elise Thompson, uh, is a simplicial vertex reduction. And it's quite simple. If you have a vertex, whose neighborhood is a clique, then you can cover that with a clique, or remove it from the graph, okay? Uh, this is very similar to kind of reduction two, which is like if I have an edge, 
I have an edge and its neighborhood is in one clique, then I could add it, right? That, so it sounds, oh, why would you do this? The original ECC reduction is just as powerful. And the answer is no. Turns out this gives you a lot more cases of reductions than the original reduction to by edge clique cover. And the question is why? There's all these like, un, there's these covered edges that are like floating around hurting that reduction, right? So the original reduction two just says, this vertex is in one clique with its closed neighborhood. Oh, uh oh, its closed neighborhood also includes that, right? In this case, you can't apply any reduction from original gram at all work uh, and reduce it. But in vertex clique cover land, this reduction is choosing that triangle. So it actually is more powerful than the original reductions for ECC, okay? Uh, and in truth, this works for any vertex clique cover reduction that does a clique removal, right? It finds a clique, remove it. You now have an ECC reduction that finds a clique and covers it in the original graph. So one of the most powerful reductions uh, in vertex cover independent set uh, here, uh, vertex clique cover is this notion of a crown reduction. Uh, what a crown is, it's an independent set and it's closed neighborhood. If there is a matching in there, so I have a matching from here to here and here to here, there's of course another matching, then you can argue that the, those matched edges, those are cliques in some minimum vertex clique cover. It's actually quite nice. Uh, and there's a simple, I guess not simple, there is a linear programming relaxation that will give you all of the all of a certain subset of crowns on the graph. So it removes sometimes half the graph in like one shot, right? So it like finds all the crowns, removes them all, and then bam. So it's like super powerful. There's nothing like this for edge cleat cover, all right? The rules for edge cleat cover are very local, very simple, but being able to remove a huge chunk of the graph in one shot is would be awesome. And so if we apply the crown reduction in vertex clique cover land, what is it actually doing in edge clique cover land? Well, here each one of these vertices uh, is an edge in the edge um, in edge land, and then you're going to have something like a lot of covered edges in some weird configuration, uh, and then you determine that whoa, those two cliques are in. Okay, um, that seems very powerful. It takes all of these uncovered or sorry, covered edges into account. So like this makes me very happy. Being able to have this reduction applied in edge clique cover, very, very, very nice. Okay. And then finally, there's another equally powerful rule, which is this degree two fold. If I have a vertex here with two neighbors that are not adjacent, it turns out you, in some circumstances for a vertex clique cover, you can do the following, take all of these vertices, collapse them down to one. And if I solve a clique cover on this, I'm solving a clique cover on the original. Basically, depending on the configuration of cliques here, it tells you I either choose this edge or that edge in the clique, right? It gives you like a choice between two, which is quite nice. Um, there is no such notion in edge clique cover land of a choice between two and doing a fold. But what is it? possibly look like? Well, I have this edge here and I have these two edges here and I they're connected via some collection of covered edges. And then I don't know what this reduction is actually going to do to it, right? Work in progress. Does it, can I do it? It seems like I should be able to, but like, is it really possible? Uh, th this is like suggesting that if I have the, a vertex clique a cover instance, I, I have exact, I, I don't know. I don't think there's this one-to-one -one relationship between the two, but I don't know at the moment. So the question is, does it actually do something there or is it strictly more powerful, right? Could you not have applied it in the original edge click cover problem? Does, does it give you like a forbidden configuration in the, in the uh, here that, so you can't map it back? I don't know, all right. But interesting question to ask. Okay, but for all of the, these removal reductions, you immediately get, an edge clique cover reduction, and quite a few of the data reductions are, um, are these removals, which kind of begs the question, like, should we even do the transformation? Like, if I could 
here, can, can I go and can I implicitly figure this out in the original graph and just apply it? And the answer is yes, but you end up enumerating all triangles, enumerating four cliques. And so the question, you'd be doing potentially more and more work. Um, so it might not be worth it. One shot transformation, just apply it, easy. Okay. All right, uh, let's talk about some experiments, all right? So we implemented all of this in C++, uh, the edge cleat cover reductions, so redo, the problem reduction, redo, the vertex cleat cover reductions, redo, and compiled it with G++11 and full optimizations turned on and call the resulting thing redo cubed X, where X is pick your favorite vertex cleat cover solver of which there exists um, several possibilities. And then you can apply that solver on the resulting graph. Okay, uh, here's the machine that we ran on CentOS Linux. Uh, four of these 2.5 gigahertz Intel Gold processors. Uh, they each have 20 cores, so there's 80 cores in the machine and 1.5 terabytes of memory. Uh, we run each algorithm; they're, they're not parallel, right? So no parallelization here. One per core. And the data sets that we use, we use some synthetic instances, uh, so randomly generated graphs. And then, uh, sorry for this, um, 52 uh, large sparse graphs that come from uh, SNAP, LAW, and CONNECT. These are standard and used uh, in other works as well. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna, I normally hate tables in talks. You probably do too. So I'm gonna walk us through it. And I think that the table in this case is actually better than a plot. You, maybe you'll see why. And maybe you'll just be like, why, the, why did you put the table in? All right, so here's what I did. Uh, we looked at Ernest Renyi graphs. So these are ones where you fix N, right? So fix the number of vertices, and then you generate edges with an independent probability P. Right, so you flip a coin with a certain probability, you put in the edge, other probability you don't put an edge, okay? And you can vary the probability to see the effect of density on the algorithm, right? When we talked about density before, we said if it's really sparse, then things are nice. If it's not so sparse, maybe things aren't so nice. And we ran uh, Graham's original implementation. The code is out there, it's on GitHub, and it's in OCaml. Ooh, man, um, it's still pretty fast though, being written in OCaml. Uh, all right, and then we have our implementation, which is in C++. Uh, so you could ask, hmm, is this a fair comparison? You'll be the judge, right? You'll be the judge. Uh, and I give them both a 24 hour time limit, right? So on these graphs, I run you for 24 hours. Let's see what comes out. All right. so. Uh, this table, I'm going to help us interpret it. I have increasing n here. So graph is getting bigger as we go down. Okay. <clears throat> Likewise, within each n, I have density increasing. Okay, Density is increasing down. And so we, we can look at two things, so the effect of increasing n, and then the effect of increasing the density within that n, and see what happens to each of these algorithms. Okay, So on this smallest graph, Graham, if you just apply the edge cleat cover reductions, it gives you a kernel of size one on average. I'm actually taking an average over five graphs here because just one graph wouldn't be all that interesting. That's cool. And you can compute it really fast, less than 0 0.01 seconds. Nice, I like that. With ours, it's zero. Uh, zero and one, yeah, 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 yeah. okay. Not, so same running time, eh, all right. Next one on these random graphs. Oh, look, we increased n. All right. Oh, zero. So it just happened to get really nice random graphs, and Graham gave us zero. Uh, and then we also gave it zero, and they're both fast. Okay. All right. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? All right. Let's jump up a little more. Okay. The kernel is increasing now in Graham land. We've got 21. And so once you hit 21, you have to do a brute force potential calculation on that. And so they're taking a little more time, about 21.02 seconds. That's, come on, child's play, all right? And then we're still in the less than 0.01 range. And we're, we're talking about N here of 256. So this is a really small number of vertices, okay? Uh, let's keep going. All right, you can see the kernel's getting bigger for Graham, but and we're starting to get bigger too, but I'm, I'm very happy with one. One's nice, okay. Graham is starting to take a bit more time. 
Okay, so we've jumped up now 10 times, tenfold. Let's keep going. All right, so gram kernel getting big. Okay, 629 vertices to try to solve with a brute force solver. Uh, with their solver uh, uh, averaged over five runs, it's become big and it's become big because one or two of them finished and it took a long time and three of them didn't finish in the 24 hour time limit. Okay, that's those asterisks. Multiple did not finish in 24 hours. All right, so the effect of kernel, the kernel size on gram, it's huge. Okay, so this is where I would say, okay, this comparison between now OCaml and C++, that doesn't happen with OCaml and C++ just because of programming language. You don't get things not finishing in 24 hours and things finishing in 0 0.08 seconds. No, right? So this has nothing to do with OCaml. This has everything to do with how small the kernel is, right? 629, really bad compared to four. All right, and then finally, here we get, oh, so maybe Graham was just unlucky and got some bad random graphs up here. It finished on all of them. It finished in five seconds and we're still finishing pretty fast, right? 0.18 seconds. As we go up, both of them are gonna start exploding, right? Because both of these techniques are eventually exponential time. The kernels will continue to go up, but what this shows you is the kernel is much smaller on these instances uh, for our method, Redo-Cube. And because the kernel is smaller, you're able to solve those instances quite a bit faster. Okay, now let's look at as the density increases. All right, so here, the gram, and we're really fast. Let's increase the density a little bit. Uh, kernel goes up big time. Running time goes up big time for gram. Our kernel goes up not quite as much, and we can solve it very quickly. Okay, let's look at the next N. Uh, no gram can solve it in 24 hours. 245 is out of the realm of solvability. 51 is still solvable for us. Let's do it again. Again, jumping up the density just a little bit from 0 0.075 to 0 0.1, gram can't solve it. We can solve it. Same thing, same thing. Same thing. So what the new technique gives you is you can handle graphs that are a little denser, right? That are a little bit denser. And maybe that's what's important for large sparse real world graphs, right? If you can handle just a little bit more density and a bit more size, then you're getting now more power out of the technique. Okay. All right. So here's what we compared on some actual real large graphs. We compared Graham, we compared our our technique that I just showed you, the branch and reduce. And then we also looked at an ILP formulation, right? So you reduce as, as far down as you can, then run integer linear program uh, using Gurobi. And then what do you get? All right, so here's the ones everybody could solve. Okay, everyone could solve. So this kernel, very small for Graham, always pretty small, it can solve it, right? Our kernel, always zero. And it's the same kernel, so I don't list it again. And both of the branch and reduce and all very quick. Okay, so that's the ones everyone could solve. What about just the ones the branch and reduce could solve? Um, here we go. Here's the ones that branch and reduce uh, could solve, but Graham could not. Big kernel, big kernel, big kernel, big kernel, big kernel, big kernel, little kernels, right? So using the new technique, you can get very small kernels. And again, this allows you to solve graphs that have hundreds of thousands of edges, millions of edges tens of thousands of edges. So we're able to solve these bigger graphs, whereas the original technique could not, okay? And you can see here the ILP also doing fine. All right, well, what if the branch and reduce can't solve it? Could the ILP solve other instances? Uh, and the answer is yes, okay? So look, Graham couldn't solve it because these kernels are absolutely out of the realm of solvability in any universe, okay? These kernels, also pretty much out of the realm of exponential time solvers. Sure, ILP also, there's so many hacks and data reductions and beautiful things in there. You can do things that, you know, highly specialized. You can solve all of these instances in pretty nice, reasonable running times. These are seconds, so this is three hours, four-ish hours, et cetera. So you can solve these big instances if you also use an ILP solver. All right. What about ones that none of them could solve? Well, what do you do with them? Run a heuristic solver and see what comes out. Do I get good results or not? All right, so what we looked at is 
uh, I ran this uh, iterative greedy solver. It's a heuristic for vertex cleat cover. Vertex cleat cover has a lower bound, which is a maximum independent set. So you can also compute a large independent set, or actually in practice, you can compute exact ones for many of these graphs using data reductions. So that gives us a lower bound from a, a maximum independent set solver, and then an upper bound from our heuristic solver. And you can look at the difference between the upper bound and lower bound and how it corresponds to the size of the graphs. And we can always get within 0 0.06 relative size of the optimal, whatever it is lying in between these. Uh, and these running times, we're talking about you know four, five, six hours. Um, but uh, this, I just ran it for six hours and saw what popped out. All right, things to note here, you have a gap of 61. We're gonna close that gap. We got, we have to. Different lower bound and we've got it. Okay, same one here, there's 60, right? And so all these gaps, they're fairly small. I think some better lower bounds and maybe an improved heuristic and you have them solved. All right, um, what next? And this is gonna be my final. Uh, there's several heuristic algorithms that have come out recently for edge cleat cover, and they compare against each other, but really we don't know how well they, like how close they are to exact, because they didn't look at that because it was hard. They didn't want to run Graham's uh, OCaml code, which actually took a while to figure out how to compile because it was old out. It was, oh, it was bad. All right. So we solved 27 instances exactly. And so we can look at for each of the heuristics, like how close are you to exact? Uh, and so Conte, this one solved five instances out of 27 exactly. Okay. AOCC solved eight instances exactly. It was a superset of the ones that Conte solved. That was interesting. So the same five plus three more. Um, that's not really that much out of 27 instances. I, I would have loved like half or more. So like, it seems like there's some additional work that can be done for heuristics. Um, Conte though found four smaller solutions simultaneously faster than EOCC. So like it did exclusively better on four instances. EOCC though found 14 smaller and faster. So it seems to be better than Conte. Um, but Conte was always fast. It was always under two minutes. And there were three instances of EOCC where it took 34, 47, and then 2.3 hours. So like there's some work to be done here. And I looked at these instances and if you have high average degree, it's just taking a long time. So they're doing something with the degrees. And so there's some improvement that can happen there. All right. Uh, so to conclude uh, our method, this redo cube, more effective than ECC reductions alone. I hope you would agree with that. Um, you probably want to use EOCC for your risk solutions, but beware of high average degree. Uh, and then some future work, integrating these data reductions into heuristic solvers, very simple. You throw in the cliques that it finds, how much does it improve heuristic solvers? Uh, you can also develop, I think, more effective branch and reduce rules. So it intermixes data reduction and branching. Um, because right now there's a very poor collection of things like bounds that are used and any kind of branching rule to get down this, this branching factor. All right, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yes. So it looks like for the exact algorithms, the reductions plus um, the ILP solver yes. was the best option you had. Yes. Uh, how much can you attribute to the reductions and to the ILP solver? So if you just run Grovi. Right. It's a great question. So I'm looking at that next. Yep. Absolutely. It needs to be looked at. Good question. Other questions? Uh, yes. I have two questions. Yep. So why do I this experiment results? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this uh, Sandeep and integrated from Android. Yeah, that's me. That's D. Yep. I'm getting Android from here that the ILP is faster than the D apprehend. Yes. So branch and reduce is really good when you have a close lower bound and upper bound for a vertex click cover problem. So if you have like a really good independent set bound, then you can solve it very quickly using branch and reduce. If there's a gap, oh, it doesn't work very well. And that's true of a lot of solvers. It's, but for example, in graph coloring, you use cliques as a lower bound. If the gap is large between the color number and the clique number, it 
hurts to solve uh, using exponential algorithms. So you get the same kind of behavior there. Yeah, that, that you mean that the, the generated uh, indecision that we are doing like uh, have a large gap in the lower Yes, that's right. So if it wasn't solving it, it's probably because there's a gap between the lower and the upper bound. And in fact, you you kind of see that in these very hard instances that no one could solve, there is this fairly large gap. In the, yep. Yeah, uh, actually, I have yes. another question. Please. Uh, yeah, I think in the, uh, in the VCC, so after you find like a you cover vertex, then you can remove this vertex. Yep, that's right. For, for the ECC, you cannot do that. Uh, if all of its neighbors are covered, then you can remove it. Um, so, I mean, sorry. No, and it goes back to this transformation. You might need the covered edge to give you the clique that covers other edges. If you start removing things that are covered, uh, actually, I, can, I think I can go back to that pretty quickly. Almost. Um, there's a little bit more. There we go. So here you needed a covered edge to get this clique that's a triangle. Otherwise you were stuck with these two edges and you make a mistake. You choose those two edges as cliques instead of the triangle. So you can't just remove covered edges from the graph. You can remove some covered edges from the graph. Yeah, think about that, why you cannot, because like for this ECT you can, you can transform the instance of the ECT. And That's right. You can remove that, like the vertex, so it's not this edge. That's right. So I still use the edge when I do the transformation. Right here, I've used those removed edges, and then I now remove their impact. But here, this edge is still kept, and it's because it corresponds with this triangle that had this uncovered edge. So it still takes into account the uncovered edges. Yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you very much for today's seminar. Thank you all for joining, and hopefully we'll see you in the next seminars. Thank you everyone. Awesome. Thanks.